In Scotland, most people don't like the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon. How dare you? But you're in, but down here you're invited to think that all Scots love the SNP, love the SNP and, and they don't. And they never have. There's never been a majority in Scotland that wants to break up the United Kingdom. Never. It was a high watermark at some point, but it was still not anywhere near overturning the Union. But I can completely understand why people down here would be given to understand that, you know, that Scotland desperately wants what Nicola Sturgeon wants, and they don't. But that's just a product of the fact that, e that Nicola Sturgeon's SNP have been very successful in loudly broadcasting their minority view for long enough that people down here think it's the majority view, which it isn't, which it never was, which it never will be. For the wrong to rule, the good must just stand idly by. Hello. Back in the days when opinions were permitted and intelligent dissent was encouraged, those of us who love language used to have jobs. But we live in different times now and we make unlikely alliances. And one of the greatest privileges of being removed from the public sphere has been to make encounters with others who have also had the courage or idiocy to speak their minds. So we come to today's guest. I can't really do a monologue about him because he's the king of them. Neil Oliver, for nine minutes every week, Neil speaks to and expresses the gentle anger, in my view, of every heart which hasn't yet given up. And for that, I am blessed by his friendship and his company. So thank you for tuning in. And I'd like to say hello to this week's guest, Neil Oliver. Hello, Neil. Yay. Hello, Lawrence. And I, I, I echo the sentiment, if, if this past two years, whatever it is, has been worth anything. It's been the connections and relationships and friendships that have unexpectedly and serendipitously been struck up and meeting you has been a great boon. So for that much, at the very least, I am grateful. We are grateful for that. Can I ask you, um, I do, when I'm listening to your monologues, and because you, I, I'm a lover of language, as you are, I don't have the, I, I'm better at delivering someone else's lines than you know, you deliver your own so beautifully. What I can hear in what you're saying is I hear words used beautifully to express some anger. Are you angry? Uh, yes, I definitely am angry. I would definitely <coughs> confess that much. And I do hold it back because um, I suppose a, a, a ranting, uh, shock jock, uh, rabble rousing style is not mine. Uh, and I would feel fake doing that. It's not really how I uh, talk in real life. Mm. And so I, I feel the anger and I, I don't give in to it and I try and just let it be there uh, simmering, simmering in the background. But I feel, is it, if it, anger, is it specifically anger? I think it's a sense of wrong. I think I feel wronged by what's going on and I think a lot of people have been wronged so it's a, f a feeling of injustice that I'm trying to articulate because I think perfectly decent normal go about their business law-abiding tax-paying people have been taken for an absolute ride their better nature has been exploited and I feel a deep sense of injustice on their behalf uh, which I try to articulate in the minutes available to me on a Saturday night which is great, and people have uh, people just share this it, stuff hugely, and it, it inspires me on a Sunday morning. I have to confess, I do. I'm never awake at that time of day because I go to bed early. But on Sunday morning, I open up and I receive my sermon, <laughs> and I, it almost feels like that in a way to me. It's like it, you're you're pulling people into a message. You're definitely saying something, and you're you're trying to communicate something, but. And I know what you're talking about injustice and all of this sort of stuff, which we I agree with 100. percent But why? Why do you? Why not just write a book? I mean, I know you write books too, but 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 why nine minutes for everybody? Uh, uh, an opportunity presented itself, essentially, and I decided to take the opportunity. What happened was I, I must I don't honestly remember uh, the the genesis, but. I, I must have put something out on social media. I know it. Well, I'd, I was putting stuff out on social media, and it came to the attention of um, uh, Mike Graham on talk radio, and he got in touch with me. 
And we started having uh, every Wednesday morning, we were having a conversation about half an hour or so on a Wednesday morning about the state of the nation. And it strayed into things, lockdown, and eventually it became about human rights and freedom of speech and all of the things that are, that, you know, that we, that brought us together, actually. Yeah. You know, we, we met via a similar, you know, sequence of events. And then when, when GB News was born, uh, I was approached because of what I had been saying on what was going out on radio. And it was being shared around, but it would go out on radio and then it was being shared around and that GB News had become aware of the, the stance that I was taking. And it was, so it was very, it was accidental. I had never meant to get into that situation. I, I put a toe in the water and then found myself ankle deep, knee deep, hip deep, and now I'm in it up to my neck. But it was by incremental processes that You're, that, you're a white supremacist now, aren't you? I am an I am an for, for I am lockdown an, I am ultra extreme. I am <laughs> I am I am politically to the right of Attila the Hun. I know, just for what demanding people have their civil liberties. Uh, and so when the when the first uh, uh, when my first show, I still feel uncomfortable calling it a show because you know, but when my first show was to go out, I said perhaps I should explain why I'm here because I felt incongruous. And I said, I should probably do a few minutes and just say, if you think it's, if you're surprised to f see me here, you know, the guy that did the coast and soft documentaries about history and sacred places, then imagine what it's like from my side of the camera. And I thought it would just give me a context and I wouldn't be pretending to be something that I wasn't. I, you know, I haven't suddenly, you know, metamorphosed into a, a, you know, a, a current affairs journalist and I wanted to acknowledge that fact. So the first monologue was purely, it was supposed to be a one-off, I suppose, really. I thought I would just do it once. But it, it seemed to, even that seemed to strike a chord and people, there was feedback about it being, you know, an honest sort of declaration of my incongruous presence. And so week two came along and I did, did another one. Hmm. And I can't remember what, what it was about. And then, lo and behold, it became a, a fixture. It became how I start, uh, it is now how I start every show but it was it was an accident i didn't i didn't come into gb news intending to soapbox the first 10 minutes of every show accidents let's talk about this okay so you uh, i watched your last monologue as i do and you talk about uh whether things are planned or whether they're accidents right i think all of the most wonderful moments uh, when i was uh, acting or you know and i hope to again one day the best bits were the, always the mistakes almost the accidents the happy accidents that brought things together that mm. created something like that now we those of us who feel how we feel seem to have divided into two camps a little bit in my view the people that the, the toby youngs who and the julia hartley brewers who say this is just incompetence the whole thing is just incompetence mm. and then there are the then you've got the you know, as far down the rabbit hole as you can go with the Delling Poles. I mean, I love them all, by the way. I'm, mm -hmm. My heart is open to everybody who is awake. Is, is what is... Uh, two questions. What's going on, and is it deliberate? I started out uh, hoping, because I come from a place of... I was never politically engaged for, the, for most of my life. I'd, I've never been a card-carrying member of anything. And I've always been somebody who I just assumed in a lazy fashion, really, that those who were in positions of authority had the country's best interests at heart, be they red or blue or, or, or yellow. Uh, I, I thought that they were coming from a place of wanting a peaceful nation in which people could thrive and that they all just had different ideas about how that might best be achieved. And that was largely, as I say, a lazy assumption that I was making without looking into it. I, I slid through the first 50 years of my life thinking that because my mind was elsewhere and I was looking in another direction while all of that was going on. And so when all of this started to happen a couple of years ago, I, I preferred to think for the sake of my own sanity that it was incompetence. Mm. I thought this is just people out of their depth because I had long felt that, you know, politics was not attracting you know, what they used to call big beasts anymore. I felt that certainly in the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years, it was 
it, it was people that I thought that old thing about it's all about public service and really these people could be making fortunes in private business and so on and I, f I think that was believable about a generation of politicians but it's definitely not believable about this generation of politicians I don't think I think in the main they're in it for what they can get out of it and it's their best option and I felt uh, this this has just been too big for them and they've fumbled the ball and I felt like that for I don't know, a few months, I suppose. We're talking about now we're, we're in March Back, 2020. Let's, let's, yeah, right from the beginning, I thought this has just overwhelmed them. They've been frightened by the images that they've seen coming out of China. They've been even more frightened by the images they've seen coming out of Italy and they've thought we best be seen to be doing something. And the and the media, the the, the mainstream media, by and large, was was baying for blood. You know, we must, we must do everything possible to avert this uh, imminent disaster. I don't think that anymore, and I haven't for the longest time. So for a year and a half, I felt that there was intent and that COVID was uh, was being used, was an opportunity, was a key in a door that had hitherto been difficult to unlock. And it unlocked a door for those who I think were intent on having a centralised authority. And you can call that a world government or a great reset or a new world order or whatever. But Just I communism. Think, I think that 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 desire to have a centralised world, one one star chamber, people in it, unelected, unaccountable, largely anonymous, making decisions and all of that, coming out to the to the wider population, nation states set aside. I, that is, I think that has been. I think that is definitely there now. And that was a very uncomfortable realisation for me to come to because I would have liked it much better if I thought they were just hapless fools. Uh, now I think they're largely irrelevant and decisions that matter are being taken by people that we don't really know. Do you feel... Um, so I, I agree with that 100%. I think it, it, there are only so many coincidences in a row before you start to go. It's not. Um, you have studied... Uh, nature, history, you know, you're, whenever we talk, I always get a great glean. So the first thing, I'm going to say the two things that I want to ask. One is um, is to ask about the Jubilee, because it's the Jubilee weekend. So I'd like to know the epistemology or epite whatever the word is. The etymology. Etymology. See, I don't even know. So, right, it's Jubilee weekend. What does Jubilee mean? <sighs> I definitely think that's it's interesting. I I do in that in there is part of me that that allows for the possibility that you know sometimes the the, the universe as it were offers things up that you just get a you just get a gift from the universe. You know the planets align or the or the tumblers in the cosmic lock click into I don't know. And I think it's worth being reminded of the concept of jubilee at the moment. Here we are, you know the whatever covid was whoever invented it, it doesn't seem to have quite made a big enough explosion to, you know, get them where they wanted to Incompetence be. Incompetence or planning? Well, it, so a, co a, we're, part, we're, we're, definitely, we're definitely, I think, post-Covid. Mm. And uh, we're in this strange limbo, waiting for the other shoe to drop at the moment. And along comes the Jubilee. Jubilee, in answer to your question, is I think it has quite a complicated uh, etymology. I think it, it comes, it, it goes back through, you know, Romance languages and into Latin and and so on. I think ultimately it comes from a a, a Hebrew word which is a jobel, j i or y o b e l, and that is well, that's really a ram, as in a boy sheep, and it's the ram's horn in this context as in an, an instrument for blowing a note and in the it, it's a it was a so that's that's what the origin of the word is it's a it's this it's a, a trumpet that was sounded and the occasion on which that trumpet was sounded was the time of a new monarch traditionally when a when a new king would come in and we're talking thousands of years ago back to the Assyrians and so on back into the bronze age it was there was an understanding that every few years, after a while, maybe a lifetime, too many people were in debt. There were too many people were enslaved. And it was 
becoming detrimental to the economic well-being of the kingdom. Because if, if too many people are incapacitated by their debt, if too many people owe too much, almost everything, to the very few, or indeed the one, it becomes counterproductive. Like Monopoly. Yeah, I mean, you know how Monopoly, Monopoly yeah. a game of Monopoly ends because one person's got everything and everyone else has got nothing. And then all the money goes back into the bank and gets, actually gets redistributed so that everyone can play again. So that's quite a good model. But there was an understanding from ancient times that this was not a good idea because if, if, if people are only working to uh, satisfy their creditors, they're not doing anything creative, they're not doing anything productive, they're not doing anything for the well-being of, of, the, of the community. People run away. You know, the kingdoms in that situation, people will take the opportunity to, you know, just duck out and go somewhere else where they're not indebted. Uh, it, it, it compromises the defence of the realm. Everything's bad. So there was an ancient understanding that you, that you, you call it quits. You reset everything, and that was the jubilee, and it's it's definitely there in the it's definitely there in the Bible. It's there in Leviticus. Uh, it's structured around um, every you know the Sabbath is the seventh day. Uh, well, every seventh every you'd have six years of everyone planting the crops and harvesting the crops and and going on. In the seventh year, you let everything go fallow, and you live off whatever the universe provides. So there's a Sabbath of Sabbaths. And then every seventh cycle of that, every 49th year, there's a, a kind of a, there's a jubilee. So in the 50th year, the debts are settled, the slaves are freed, and everyone recoups and starts again. So it's ancient understanding. When, when, when Jesus gives his first sermon, I think it's in... Is it Matthew? You'll be better at this I'm terrible, than me. but it's it's early Matthew because I was. He basically com- he basically comes in and says, "I am gonna I'm gonna this is going to be the year of atonement. I bring with me a settling of debts. The, our father traditionally was the prayer was was uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It became modified later into trespasses and trespassers because by that point. There had, become, there had there was a moralising tone about people having to settle their debts, and it became it was un, it was uncomfortable for creditors to contemplate having to say right the game's a bogey, he it will redistribute all the money again, so they would moralise about the, the the moral necessity to settle your debts. But that's why it was in in Scottish schools. I remember learning the Lord's Prayer, and it was it was forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And a lot of the Bible is more about. Uh, uh, settling debt than sin it, it, it's actually a lot more about economic transactions and than you might think because, and so Jesus comes in with an understanding that you know you can't have everyone in debt it, it, it just and there, are, there, there comes a point when people are so indebted that the debts will never be paid so you just have to write them off because otherwise and in, in Isaiah Isaiah prophesies that if you if you let things run their course in that monopoly way, you end up with one person having all the farms, all the land, all the houses, and everybody else has been driven away. And that one, you know, he, he's warning: if you go on like this, one of you will end up all on your own with everything. And then where will he be? Mm. And you know, Jesus comes in and makes that first sermon, and he unrolls the Isaiah scroll, and he says, "I am here to settle debts." And that's why they killed him, <laughs> because that you know that's that's a big problem for wealthy people. What do you mean? Who's this joker? He says we've got to... I've just gathered up all the money. Now this joker says we've got to give it all back. <laughs> <laughs> to hell with that! Yeah. Get me a plank of wood. And so that's, so that's how... That's, that's, the, that's why he made the enemies that he made. The point is, there's an ancient understanding that always you get to a point where people are too indebted and you just have to write it off. Because if you don't... That's what brought down Rome. Rome fell in the end because... They let it run too far, and too many people were too indebted. And you might that the elite, the handful, might think that's great because they end up owning everything, and everybody else owns nothing, and they're happy, except they're not. And the walls come tumbling down. So, four thousand years ago, we knew that there comes a point where you have to settle the debts, write them off, and we've forgotten that. And I think the universe is telling us. In the midst of all of this, we're looking at a financial disaster coming down the line. The economy is tanking. If it hasn't tanked, it's going to tank. The debts have got to a point where they can't be repaid. 
And lo and behold, I think the financial world has to look at a new reality, has to think the unthinkable, and the unthinkable might be... Settling the debts. Write off the debts, or at least write them down, because that's what they do for corporations. Yeah. In 2008... They did it. They wrote down the, the debts, all that, all those dodgy mortgages that, that had been given out to people that couldn't pay them and all the rest of it. But the, nobody foreclosed on the banks. You know, nobody took the, everything away from them. They were, they were allowed to just write down the bad debts. But when it comes to you and me, Joe Public, Jane Public, banks foreclose on us. They take the house. They take your business. They take everything you've got. Well, they have to start thinking the unthinkable and saying, well, this is the only way out of this nightmare is to write off the debt. So I completely resonates 100% with me. There it seems to be a, a natural law which is very against de- uh, against centralization and evolution to me is the exact opposite of centralization. So I suppose the only bit of ho- the, the hopeful part of this for me in my understanding of nature rather than mankind is that nature will resist this move. Do you think that's correct? Yes, I think fundamentally... I, I, a lot of people have been writing to me and it's been a game. People write to me with no address yeah. and the letters come to me. Some very beautiful pictures. Yeah, great stuff. Um, I get some that come to you-know-who Sterling. Yeah. I like the one where it's just a picture of a guy with long hair. Sometimes it's a really bad, uh, uh, like, yeah, you but know, you had it as your hangman sketch. Uh, I did. <laughs> um, and a lot of the letters are about fundamentals, good and bad, good and evil, light and dark, right and wrong. And it has become, I think this has become something about right and wrong. So, I, yes, I think you're, you're right as well about it not being nature's plan that the many end up, from an evolutionary point of view, subjugated, subject to the few. I don't think that's the. I don't think that's the plan. And I also think, even more fundamentally, I think what is being attempted is wrong, possibly even evil. And what evil? I, the that that centralising. That, but that, is evil that, a thing, or is it? Is it? So I've got this real problem with evil. I I believe in good and evil. I it, it, I have to in order to operate my. I, th- I think intellect. they're. I think they're possibly. You know, they're they're older words. They, they can. It can sound a bit, I suppose, antiquated, um, uh, out of out of date to to talk in terms of uh, good and evil, but I think it's just an an old way of uh, expressing, an understanding that might now be expressed in, in different terms. But I, I th- but for all that, I think it still counts. I think everyone is almost born knowing the difference between right and wrong. I think children know the difference between right and wrong. There's, a, there's an, in, there's an well, instinctual... Well, they, ex- they did experiments, didn't they, with the, the swing experiment with the young kids, with Jonathan Haidt. Um, is it OK to push it? They, they, you know, can you push another child off the swing? and whether that was a, a appropriate and which, which age a child developed a moral view yeah, wh- on it. Whether, pe- whether people uh, do good things or, ba- or bad things, that's a choice. But mm-hmm. they know the difference. Everyone knows the difference between right and wrong. And I th- So I think whether it's natural law that's being traduced by what's happening, I think even more fundamentally, it's what is being uh, 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 imposed upon people is wrong. And everyone knows it. That's why, that's what's made so many people feel so inexpressibly uncomfortable. It's so basic. I think we almost don't have the vocabulary to express it because it's reaching right back into beyond infancy. And it's, I've expressed it before. I've said that I, I felt that my, I have never responded physiologically to something the government did before. Mm. I've reacted maybe intellectually but when this started unfolding two years ago, lockdown, uh, excuse me, can they do, 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 does it turn out they can do that? They can send us home. Oh. It was as if a lizard bit of my reptilian brain back in the amygdala or whatever did that. I've said this before, because that is exactly what it felt like to me. I felt something happen physically. I've never had a physical response to threat before, like from the, from the state. 
And because I had never had it before, I thought I better pay attention to this. Mm. And I think so many people are writing to me and writing to all sorts of people. I'm not, you know, it's not that's. But the people that are writing to me are struggling to express something that is a deeply felt physical response to what's happening. People talk about, you know, not being able to sleep, that there's something gnawing away at their insides, uh, that they cannot express what it is that they feel, but they know it's a bad feeling that they want to go away. They're, they're almost back into the language of children, you know, trying to explain an outcheat. Yeah, it's completely apolitical. That's there's, been there's no, upon them. There, there was no politics about it whatsoever. You know, it's a reaction, it's a response, a natu- it's, a, it's a response. And what people are responding to, quite rightly, is the fact that what is being done to them is wrong. Mm. Absolutely, fundamentally and morally wrong. And the fact that you could lock down healthy people. See, I want to fight my desire to go, you know what, who are the people that, um, you know, the, the or- who Orwell spoke of, you know, this hope it lies in the polls, who are the people that you've got to destroy in order to implement any of this stuff. So the minute they did lockdowns, I went, well, you're just going to kill pubs and flower shops and corner shops. Well, not corner shops because they didn't close, but, you know, like interesting artisan businesses. You're going to kill each and every one of those, or at least a vast proportion of them. And I feel that that was motivated in a way in, in order to to take yet more control over us. So I think what terrified me is was that we have, given into it and Matthias Desmet and all this stuff have been looked into now in terms of this mass formation that it's develops around us. Yeah. What our 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 power is what? What what how are we how are we you know, you speak, I speak, others speak, we all speak in different ways and that's really great. So we become a, a kind of a collective bubble of dissent against this. But w- what is going to happen, do you think? So if I said to you, Neil, f- two years ago, no one would have ever have imagined we could have been locked down, right? So now we've gone, well, it's kind of happened. What, what, what's going to happen? What, what's your, because you, to me, you're a bit of a prophet. Now you may be, uh, you may be a false satanic evil prophet because, you know, who knows, we've all got to doubt ourselves, which is what we do. But what do you see? Where's it, where are we going? I think uh, the side that we understand ourselves to be on Mm. will win. I couldn't begin to put a time frame on that. You know, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. But But someday and someday soon. But it will happen. And I think it will happen because what is being done uh, is anti-human. I... uh, it, it, from when this when this began when I began thinking it wasn't about incompetence it was actually something that it was an, it was a desire on on behalf of a, of a, of a very small elite to centralise power and money quickly though why really talk- why do they want it why does some why does Rishi Sunak who's got a wife who's worth yeah, yeah, because, billions of because, pounds want well, to be in government because they're frightened I think it's a, it's a, I think I'll cut they're frightened of of there's a, there's 7.4 billion people on the planet and i think there's a there's a, a there's a group that have been able to place themselves behind behind castle walls who are frightened of the masses they don't like and they don't they they're frightened of them because they don't really get the humanity right. i think and i've 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 used the analogy before of uh, sheldon cooper in the big bang theory have you seen Sheldon Cooper no. in the Big Bang Theory? Well, the pre- oh, the Big Bang Theory, the, Big the Bang TV Theory. show. Yes, yes, yes. No, yeah. So Sheldon Cooper is smart beyond th- th- imagining. Yeah. He, you know, he's an, a, 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 an autistic savant, but he lacks empathy. He doesn't get people, and that's his Achilles heel. And that's why Penny, who's an ordinary Jane who lives across the hall, continually outsmarts him and comes out on top because she empathises, understands, she's of the people, she understands the way people think. So for all his uh, uh, technical uh, physics genius, he, he has that fatal genetic flaw that he doesn't understand the very species that he wants dominion over. Yeah. Sheldon kind of wants to rule the world. 
and he is frightened of the outside world and he is frightened of the mass of the population because he doesn't understand them they're weird they want to hug and kiss and 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 have sex and they they want to do all these things that are utterly alien to him and so he would like to be able to control them and stop them doing all of that and it comes ultimately i would say from a place of fear and incomprehension and i think what's being a <laughs> what what an elite is trying to it's coming from their incomprehension and i think the that reason is i think incompetence to a degree right yes because i think it's, it's a misunderstanding of mind. i think it's a misunderstanding they don't get us so that is an incompetence though but this is what i'm saying if, yes, it, if I, it's I, a I planning or not a plan, so this is the the fundamental question if it's a planning or not a planning it's that they, they are incompetent of their own malevolence. I think. I think at some level they, they possibly you know to give the devil his due. I think there is there is they possibly think that what they have in mind would actually be beneficial. Yeah. I think they. I think at some level some of them do think that we would have nothing and we would be happy. Yeah. But they're just completely wrong about that, and the reason I think we will eventually win is because I think they're underestimating humanity. I think you know with AI, I think about artificial intelligence and transhumanism and all the rest of it. I don't think, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting proposition, but I think we haven't even begun to scratch the outside edge of what the flesh, bone and blood human being is capable of. Already, they, we used to say this at school, they used to go, you don't even know, they, we don't even use a tiny percentile of our brain. I, so why would you invent a bit I, of AI to improve I, I, I something you're not using already? I don't think we've, we've properly understood what we are capable of it's an endless fascination to me that all of this that we have that we have seen and done comes from three and a half pounds of pink meat. In a, in a you know that little you know trapped inside a you know under underneath a cap of bone, there's mm. three pounds of pink meat mm. that comes up with poetry, and and AI and the internet and Love. flight to the moon, and it comes from a, it comes from meat. And I don't think we've explored what that... I don't think we understand that at all. And I think the people who understand it least, ironically, are the people who, are, who have decided that they're ready to move on already. You know, it's as though someone, it's as though peop, someone arrived just on the outskirts of a, the, the greatest city on earth and having looked at it from a distance said, no, that's not for me, let's go and build another city somewhere else, without ever bothering to find out what Constantinople was even like, mm. never having actually penetrated it. They've decided that they could go and build something better with concrete and steel, never knowing, not having explored at all the potential of Constantinople, which was the product of, of, of a thousand years of, of thought and imagination. And I, th I think there's something analogous in the way that those who purvey notions like artificial intelligence, they're not allowing for the, the human animal. I think, I think it's demonstrably the case that the human animal is the most extraordinary product of the universe in 14 billion years or whatever the age of the universe is there might in in it in the whole place there might be nothing that's as extraordinary as the human animal mm. and it's a fundamental failing i think of, of those who would seek to control us that they want to do it and they're motivated to do it i think not necessarily out of badness but because they don't get us and they think that the artificial ersatz version of life that they have in mind for us is genuinely better than all the messy, sweaty, chaotic, unpredictable human life that, that is us and it in seems, reality. It seems to be a sort of it seems to be an affliction of what is loosely called the West, isn't it? The Anglosphere which is highly prosperous. So is are there historical um there are, I'm sure. You know, uh, uh, other echoes well, that we well, should be looking at. Well, well, civilizations always run their course. You know, they ri they rise and they fall. You know, the you know we were talking earlier about the whole uh, the whole sort of jubilee idea, that idea of of settling debts. You know, back in Ur, or back in Babylon, in Mesopotamia. You know, Hammurabi, who who put down the first, who, who brought together the first law. You know the law of Hammurabi. You know eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, all of that stuff. Uh, he, he, within his understand, within the, the the law that he that he was 
putting out there was this, that notion of you know, every now and again we're going to have to let everybody off the hook or, or, the, or, the, or the game will just run out of steam. Well, Babylon fell. Babylon's behind us. But so too is the, you know, the Persians. So too Greece, Rome. Ottomans. They all, it always falls. And you know, you've got you've got philosophers or thinkers like you know Polybius and uh, who talked about anacyclosis, which is the idea of the, of of, uh, of civilization going through phases. The good king is great; he's he's a lovely fella, got nice idea, and he's benign. But and everything's fine while he lives. But then he passes, he hands on the kingdom to his son. Now his son's just been handed it. He didn't earn it, didn't work for it, isn't necessarily as good. Things begin to fray at the edges. The powerful men around him, the aristocrats, they take power from him because it will run this better, and they do for a while. But then it passes to their descendants, and their descendants are corrupt. And then you've got oligarchy, you know, the, just the rule of rich, privileged people. And then the people get upset about that, and they overthrow the oligarchs. And then you've got democracy, which is good at first because it's well-meant and it's well-intentioned. But with the passage of time, that corrupts and decays into the mob. And the mob is chaos, and no one likes the mob. No one's happy with the mob. What rises from the mob is a demagogue, a charismatic figure who says, trust me and I'll lead us to the sunlit uplands. But then the demagogue is ultimately disastrous as well, and then the thing comes full circle and he's overthrown by the benevolent king. And off we go again in a cycle that runs through through generations and whatever. And then there's also you've got people like um, Kenneth Clark, the art historian, not the, not the MP, who had that... Uh, television series and book in the 1970s, Civilization, and he uh, talked and wrote about how civilizations become exhausted from the inside, because things are are good enough for so long that people take them for granted, uh, they become bored, and then there's uh, there's an anxiety that comes from the boredom. You know, C.P. Cavafy, contemporary Greek poet. You know, he did a, something about waiting for the barbarians, that, where, where there's a poem where he describes a an indolent, exhausted population behind their, their civilised city walls and word reaches them that there are barbarians nearby and they're saying to each other, you know, why, why, why is anyone, you know, why are, uh, why are the senators in, in, the, in the town square making new laws? Because after all, the barbarians are coming and they're going to shake things up. And why, why is anybody planting crops? Because after all, the barbarians are coming. And then eventually... Word reaches them from their scouts that the barbarians aren't there, they're gone. And they're like, oh, you're joking. At least the barbarians were going to do something. Mm. They were barbarians, but it was going to be different. And please, God, let us have something different. So there's, an, there's, a, there's an exhaustion comes into every civilization at the end. That, you know, Rome, Greece, they eventually just, oh, do you know what? But then why, then why, why say anything about it? Like it, so that, what you've just described to me is really... Hopeful, and I, I sort of share the view, which is... Well, there's a hope in it, because yeah. you, you think, well, the bad times pass. Yeah. This too shall pass. Mm. You know, that ring that Solomon's supposed to have had, you know, he asked someone to give him, a, a, you know, something that he could always, you know, when all else fails, I, I need something that I can count on, and so some jeweller gives him a ring inscribed with this too shall pass. So whatever it is, just wait a minute, and there'll be something else along. And that that will happen. So I think we've, we've, we, our generation... Uh, in the West, we are living through a time of change, a paradigm change, maybe, a, a, certainly a, a time of disruption and a time of upheaval. Um, and it's it's it, it comes upon every a generation every once in a while that has to live through this this that we are going through. This is we've caught it. We in the you know in the in the past the parcel thing. You know we've been handed the parcel and the music stopped, and we're going to have to tear the paper off and see what's. See, I, I feel, <coughs> I feel um, fearful sometimes. I try and avoid fear and replace it with worry because it's easier, as you say, this too shall pass. But I do have a sense of fear that the way that we're heading now, so, you know, just on the purely practical things of life, like, you know, doubling the cost of people's ability to heat the houses, for example, and the poorest people in society. When does... The mob, not the mob, but, but what, in my view, what will happen will, is that people will say, I've had enough, and they will rise up against... Um, so we, we, we seem to be in, in between the mob and the demagogue. Is that what, where we're at now? Yeah, I think I'm never... I'm not in favour of revolution. No. I, I hear a lot of people saying, you know, it's time, let's take up the cudgels, whatever. Um, I Revolutions devour their children, as mm. they say. It always ends badly. 
French Revolution went really ugly and bloody really fast. And then they carried on, didn't they, in the terror? But it's, yeah. what's that thing about um, if you're planning revenge, dig two well, graves? It, well, then it calmed down. At the turn of the 19th century, Napoleon, he got a... <laughs> Got a grip on it. He Stop got, chopping yeah, everyone's head not, off. He just did the periodic table, mate. I'm not saying Napoleon was, you know, was, um, you know, was the second coming Sorry, or anything, but he did, he did calm, he did calm that situation down. But then, the, you know, you have got the October Revolution in 1917 in Russia. It goes really bad, really. Revolutions, year zero, do away with all the old. It, 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 the people that want revolution are only destructive. Mm. It, it, you know that work of that work of uh, Roger Scruton put it far more eloquently, you know, something about, you know, that the, 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 the creation is the work of years and lifetimes and destruction's just five minutes and it's fun. Yeah. But all you end up with is rubble. And the people that want revolution and want destruction, um, they don't have an idea about what should replace it. They just want to, th they just want rid of what they've come to, dis they've, what they've beheld every day, they've come to despise and treat with contempt and they just want it gone. On both sides though. This well, is I, the I think ironically, What's happening is that the revolution is happening from within. I think the state is revolting in both senses. Oh, of the hang world. on, what do you mean? Well, I think it's going to come down to the people to stop the revolution. We are having a revolution imposed upon us from within the state. That's, call it the Great Reset, whatever you want. That's the name on the revolution. Okay. And I think what, what, will, what has to happen is that the people are... The people are, are in the main instinctively conservative with a small C. You know, if if you have if you have a home and a life and a job, a garden or a hobby, children, broadly speaking, you want to keep that going. Mm. You want to maintain that. And if you if you if you spread that out into the mass of the population, it's a population who in the main want that. They want to have their families, they want their families to be all right, they want to have a job have food on the table and have all the things of normal life they want and they want to keep it and they're up against a, a state at the moment a revolting state that wants to take all of that away and the solution is not revolution the solution is to it's like a big house that we all live in and it's an old house and bits of it are falling down now and it maybe needs a bit of an overhaul but you don't knock it down you maintain the structure and you root out the woodworm and the rotten timber and you replace it. But what you want to end up with is the house preserved and conserved that you can hand on to the next generation. That, that's the solution. So and it's incumbent upon us to stop the revolution, so not we, have a revolution. Yeah, so you find the people that want to uh, stop that roof leaking. Why and by what means are the people underneath the roof going... Why do you want to mend the roof? Ah, oh, you're a racist transphobe for wanting to mend the roof. You know, why are the people, the very people that you're actually trying to really genuinely represent, turning around, uh, and is it a manufactured and concocted thing that's come through the, the magic of the uh, ability uh, of the internet to spread things across the world? I, you know, think, so I think most people aren't. Most people just want a quiet, decent life. But you're not hearing from them. The loud people who want to shout about the next thing, whatever is the cause celebre of the moment, the trans or whatever, yeah. they've got the microphone, and they and that's that you're getting this distorted, uh, out of proportion sense of how many people want that. Yeah, most people don't want that. It's like an orchestra where the triangle is amplified massively, and every time it goes ding, Mo you're like, Oi! most people just want what the the life that they've had. The, the the regular decent whatever whatever word you want to use to describe it they just want that and they're not interested in this madness about you know why am I interested in it why are you interested in in those people so I suppose I come across them all the time right I come across and they really go at me I mean I, I don't really read well, them well, I, I believe they're a minority they are definitely pure, a minority. pure and simple they are a minority and I think far too much attention is being paid to them and the and the and the um, too much of the media is pandering to their nonsense, mm. and so there's a distortion. It's the same as it's the same in, to some extent. It's the same but different. In Scotland, most people don't like the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon. How dare you? 
But you're in, but down here you're invited to think that all Scots love the SNP, love the SNP and, and they don't, and they never have. There's never been a majority in Scotland that wants to break up the United Kingdom. Never. It was a high watermark at some point, but it was still not anywhere near overturning the Union. But I can completely understand why people down here would be given to understand that, you know, that Scotland desperately wants what Nicola Sturgeon wants, and they don't. But that's just a product of the fact that, it, that Nicola Sturgeon's SNP have been very successful in loudly broadcasting their minority view for long enough that people down here think it's the majority view, which it isn't, which it never was, which it never will be. Scotland used to be Labour, mainly. Is that is that correct? That's absolutely... That's partly... That's really where the problem... Part of the problem... Well, the problem comes from there because the, the devolution settlement was put together by Labour. Donald Dewar... He, he, he you know, and others were the architects, but, but it was Labour that were the architects of... Tony Blair's... Labour were the architects of, of the devolution settlement that put devolved parliaments in Belfast, Cardiff and Edinburgh. And because Labour had always bestrode Scotland like a colossus, they imagined that they always would. They just thought, that's, that's it. Labour man will always dominate in Scotland. That's never going to change. So, quite frankly, we don't need to worry too much about the nitty-gritty of how we set up that parliament because everything's just going to continue on like it always has, i.e., run by us. And so the version of proportional representation that they handed off as part of the devolution settlement was a, a disaster. It was supposed to ensure that no one party would reach a majority to dominate the assembly in Edinburgh. But it, if, you were, if you spent long enough looking at it as the SNP did, you can game the system and you can, and so Scotland is now dominate. Scotland's a one-party state, effectively, because the only people who care are the SN. You know, they're, you've got this small, highly motivated group, who, who have who have taken the reins, mm. and and the, and the rest of the population aren't particularly thrilled about that. You, what what needs to happen at some point is for there are different unionist interests, and they need, and different people at different times have laid out a very simple route map to how you get this done but it involves people stepping aside in you know in that constituency there that unionist has the best chance so all the other unionists have to step aside and it's it, it would appear that it's just not in the dna of political parties to operate in that way no. even towards what might be regarded as the greater good but even like so, Ticey and um, William Clouston and um, it, Mike Cookham it, it, and they're, they're it could all easily, standing it could easily, it could easily be done. But it they're standing in Wakefield now. My guess, I could be wrong. My guess is that they won't get their deposit back. And if they did, that would be a success. Mm. So people are going right. I want. I need to vote for something. Yes, you can do the. You know, right. You need to step aside. You need to step aside. But do people? Are we so locked in to this idea, like in America, between the Republicans and the Democrats, between Labour and the Conservatives? Are we so locked in that it doesn't really matter? Well, I think it genuinely doesn't matter now. Right. I think the, the, the worst of it is it genuinely doesn't matter. I think, as many other people have said, that left, right, Labour, Conservative are, are essentially redundant terms now. They're, well, yeah, as you said earlier, they're in revolution. You've got, you've got people, they're in cahoots, yeah. never mind that. They're all aiding and abetting. There, 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 there's now uh, you're now either uh, someone who likes things liberal, or you're an authoritarian. Mm. That's the division, and the Conservatives and Her Majesty's opposition and the rest of the little wizards in in Westminster seem in the main to be collaborating to foment a, an authoritarian situation. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Labour get in at the next. They might do things differently economically. I don't know. But I don't think it would matter if if Labour became the next government. They're unrecognisable from each other. It wouldn't aren't make they? any. No, they are. You know, it's that animal farm thing. You know, you look through the window at the, you know, at the at the pigs sitting down with the farmers, and you can't tell which is which. Mm. That has happened. One of the things I have noticed is that um, everyone flies into Glasgow on their private jets to talk about how globally we're going to deal with climate change. And I think, 
just instinctively as a punter doesn't sound like that's democratic in some way and then I hear that they everyone's flown over to wherever they've flown over to talk about well they don't need to fly they can do it, they can arrange it in whichever way they want to but we're now talking about a WHO treaty over global health and and how we're going to manage uh, future pandemics which no doubt have been grown in biolabs somewhere uh, sorry but that's how I feel about it um, what is your thoughts on the um, on this proposed WHO well, the, treaty the, the WHO treaty is you know, I said on I said uh, on on GB News that I think it's the greatest power grab that's ever been attempted ever why does no one give a shit why didn't? Why is it I, not on the front page of the newspaper, the Daily Mirror? Who's like, way? Where's for the people? Why don't they? Why does no one write well, about it? Well, you know, you, I think you ultimately, I think you probably have to play that game where you follow the food chain up to the top and find out that everything's owned by uh, um, Vanguard and um, BlackRock. BlackRock. I mean, mm. which they, which it is provably done now. Uh, so which is which is demonstrably the case. Why no one cares? I think. There's still so many people who who are, as I was, labouring under the misapprehension that those characters who appear behind podiums telling us what's going to happen have our best interests at heart. Mm. I think there are still too many of people who are in that dream state. Um, And there's the continual narrative, I, I hear it all the time when I raise my voice in trepidation about what the WHO treaty could mean for 190 odd countries all you know coming together and accepting a star chamber of unelected unaccountable bureaucrats Led deciding when there's an emergency communist. defining what an emergency is and then furthermore telling regardless of the 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 governance of the nation states saying mandated vaccines or lockdowns or whatever just because we say so and when I raise my voice in, in trepidation about that, people say, well, there's nothing to worry about really because that treaty wouldn't have teeth and and you don't have to worry about people like Klaus Schwab. He's just a, he's almost a, a cartoonish figure and, you know, it's just light entertainment. Don't worry about it. None of that really will ever matter. And I am kind of feel as if I'm, you know, like many other people, drumming my fists on the other side of the soundproof glass saying, but, but no. But millions is, are following you. Millions are watching your. Yeah, there's your plenty, monologue. there are plenty of people. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I, re- I remain, I remain optimistic because there are plenty of people and more every day who think, no, hang on, over my dead body, and that is what they're about. This is uh, softly, softly, catchy monkey, nudging the populations ever closer to submitting to centralised control, mm. and ultimately, this, the centralised control will be financial. That's what will all be. That's what will all. That's when we'll. If everyone submits to digital IDs and uh, central bank digital currencies, then at that point, game's a bogey. Mm. But I don't think enough people ever will submit to that. And, and I, I don't think they'll do it in any violent, flaming torches, uh, you know, attacking the Winter Palace kind just of will way. Not comply. There will just be a qu- There will just be a quiet non-compliance. You know, look at the vaccine take-up. Some, at least 30% of the population of Britain haven't had one jab. And, and, even, that, and that and maybe London, con- it's more. And that may be a conservative estimate. Maybe it's half. Who knows? You know. So that's that's already happened. So that n- nudging everyone towards that centralised uh, uh, state of being via the the vaccine passports or whatever. Mm. Phew, that's that's died on its arse. That's not got the momentum to carry it over the. Fin- it's not going to get anywhere near the finish line. So you know there'll be there'll be the next thing. Yeah. I'm sure, uh, but the. I think it's I think it's because too many people think oh, it's, it's too ridiculous. Of course, there's not going to be a world government. That's just the stuff of Orwellian so novels. Will, will we cross that bridge when we come? Is what what I'm saying is it seems like you know we we got hit with the COVID and all this sort of stuff, and then then we got these free speech bills coming through and online harm. The and thing I'm most concerned about, and I don't even I, amongst the many things I don't understand is the is money, currency, wealth, the. I see it all the time the the reluctance of so many, you know, coffee shops and whatever to take cash. The cashless economy is among us, and it's it seems to be building. And I and I think that that the central freedom that upon which everything else depends. I think freedom of speech is a close second. 
But freedom to transact is number one. Really? So you'd put freedom to transact ahead of freedom uh, of speech? Marginally, but yes. Why? I think we have to be able to transact with one another freely and without the interference or indeed the observation of the state. Otherwise, nothing else is possible. If you can't do that, if you can't, if you can't have your own choices about how you spend your money, then, you're a slave then you've already. got nothing. You're a slave already at that point. And it doesn't matter whether you've got free speech or not, because slaves have free speech too. They just have it has private. to be. We have to have that that transactional freedom. Mm. And I think there's ancient wisdom around that. This the species, the civilizations that have gone before us, as we've already covered, have understood something central about the the, the economic, the, the the importance of currency, the proof of work. All of that is has been understood for a very very long time. And I, I keep my eye on what's happening to money, even though I don't understand money markets. I feel that the, the essential freedom is the freedom to transact. And well, if we don't have that, then everything else, including free speech, means is nothing. gone. Well, and it is weirdly one of the only social constructs that people actually abide by. Now, um, we've got to nearly our hour. Um, I want you to do me a favour. Um, you are always quoting things at me because I love them. So what a piece of literature or a thought, something that resonates in your mind? I wish you'd a pre short, me a bit. Of sorry, I don't. Well, I, just anything. It can be one sentence or it can be 25 paragraphs, but just something that comes into your head about today and what people, what, what people should leave thinking or just listening to as we finish up our conversation. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life's star, hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar. Not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Nothing can bring back the hour of splendour in the grass, of glory in the flower. We will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind in the soothing thoughts that spring out of human suffering, in the faith that looks through death, in years that bring the philosophic mind. The clouds that gather round the setting sun do take a sober colouring from an eye that hath kept watch o'er man's mortality. Another race hath been, and other palms are won. Thanks to this human heart by which we live, thanks to its tenderness, its joys and fears, to me the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears. And that's from Intimations of Immortality. Who wrote it? It's... Um, um, but I, it's uh, it's you, like, I, I'm so nice get it for free. I get to, it's so beautiful. I just love the... What's the line on the grass that it says about the grass? The, um, uh, the, the splendour in the grass, the, the glory in the flower. The splendour in the grass. Nothing will bring back the hour of splendour in the grass, of oh, glory in the flower. See, so you're talking about the things that really it's, cut um, you deeply. It's, um, it's, um, what's his, it's um, a, a host of golden daffodils. Yeah, yeah, it's Wordsworth. It's, it's Wordsworth. It's, it's, Wordsworth. Actually, it's uh, intimations of immortality. Immortality. I, I think we want a cultural revolution of the... Not revolution. We want a cultural redecoration of yes, the house. Yes, the social contract is broken. Yeah. You know, we've been, they've taken advantage of good people. Mm. The social contract, as described by whatever Hobbes or and the rest, that we keep our noses clean, we behave and do our bit, and in return, the state will protect our freedoms, keep us safe from harm. That contract has been broken. They're not only broken, shattered, it's been, in my view. And I think part of the solution lies with people stepping away from the social contract because it's not us that broke it. You know, we weren't the unfaithful partner in the relationship. We have been cheated upon and the, the solemn vows taken have been broken, but not by us. And it's no longer, I think, incumbent upon us to live by the social contract, up to and including paying tax and all of the rest of those things. We're in a situation now where I think people quite rightly should feel entitled to come together in different communities, come together in different ways, be they people who are in physical proximity to one another 
or people who are joined together by by the wonders of the internet because that is a double-edged sword that that gives as well as takes away and I think people have to find new ways to relate to one another and to ignore the state because the state has let us down because it doesn't have our interests at heart. Love you. Okay. Good man. Thank you.